The Medici Family, the True Rulers of the Renaissance The Medici Family started out as a small money-lending business in Florence, Italy, at the start of the Renaissance, to become one of the most powerful families in history. They had four popes, married into several of the European royal houses, and unintentionally helped to spark the Reformation. They were the patrons of the arts and sponsored people like Michelangelo, Brunelleschi and Leonardo da Vinci. Before they quietly disappeared from the European power scene. So, who was the Medici family? How did they rise from relative poverty to become the rulers of the Renaissance? What really happened? This is history with Magnus. The Medici Bank was a small business run from the backroom of a wool shop by Giovanni de Medici. Giovanni had risen from relative poverty and he had become a smart businessman who chose his clients carefully. At the start of the 15th century the Medici family knew the papacy was corrupt and in chaos. With enough financial backing, any cardinal stood a chance at becoming the most powerful man on earth, namely the Pope. The Medici found their candidate in a man named Baldassare Cosa, who was a former pirate who now had a career in the church. He wanted to go to the Vatican to become Pope himself. He found the bankroller he needed in the Medici family. Giovanni Medici with this made an enormous economic gamble and backed the unlikely outsider with a huge loan. He supported Cosa all the way up from priest to cardinal. In 1410 with the backing of Giovanni, Baldassare Cosa was elected Pope John XXIII. The new Pope didn't forget his friends and the Medici soon became God's bankers, they got that account over all the other big Florentine families. With their sudden leap in status, the Medici joined an elite group of powerful Florentine families, who ran the city. The Republic was supposedly a democratic state, but the truth is that it was the wealthiest families who ruled, through their patronage of their clients. Today we would call that, an oligarchy, and now the Medici were one of those oligarchs. The Medici had made it, and this was only the beginning. In 1429, Giovanni de' Medici died, and the city of Florence mourned one of their patrons, and Cosimo de' Medici became the head of the family. Giovanni's death cast an uncertainty over the family's future. Cosimo's rivals, the Abizzi family, had governed Florence for generations and their power was being usurped by the Medici. As Cosimo's wealth and power had increased, so did the resentment of the ruling Albizzi family. They were rapidly losing their grip on the government, influence and power in Florence. A battle between the two rivaling families was now inevitable. Realizing the danger they were in, Cosimo transferred vast sums of money out of the city and made sure his family was safe. He knew that there would be no holding back. They would bribe people, get you killed, and intimidate in order to influence and win. On the 7th of September 1433, Cosimo was summoned to the palace of government where the Albizzi were waiting for him. They were planning to get rid of him once and for all, and Cosimo was now at the mercy of his enemies. He was locked into a cell, known as the Babiria, in the topmost room at the tower of the palace of government. Cosimo was sure he would be thrown to the ground from the tower, but he was instead accused of treason against the city and her people, and a quick vote was taken, where the Medici supporters were denied to vote, and Cosimo was found guilty. But Cosimo was able to enter into a secret negotiation, from his cell, for his own life, knowing that his money could talk for him. He was able to bribe his way out. In his memoir of the event, he said that he paid his jailers a bribe to let him out, but he wasn't impressed with their negotiation skills, saying, they could have had much much more for my safety. Cosimo had survived with his life, but he and his family were now banished from the city and the Albizzi family were now back as the most important and influential family in Florence. But life in Florence without Cosimo's money wouldn't be easy for the city. The Medici Bank had funded most of the city's commercial activity and Florentine business soon ground to almost a complete halt. Cosimo of course knew this, and anticipated that the people of Florence would soon tire of the Albizzi. He also called in a favor from his most powerful friend, the Pope, and agents of the papacy soon descended on Florence. 
This meant that the Albizzi had lost, and Cosimo's exile was over. When Cosimo was offered control of the city of Florence, he humbly accepted and the Medici were back in business. They again controlled Florence. Political questions were now settled at his will and he decided who were to hold the different positions in Florence, he was a king in everything but name. Under Cosimo, the Medici Bank expanded and they now had branches from Barcelona, to modern-day Belgium and all the way to Cairo. On behalf of the Church and the Pope in Rome, the Medici Bank became the bulldog collector of money, from almost every parish in Europe. Almost every coin that ended up in the Vatican, went through the Medici's bank and no one was exempt. Being the collector for the Pope, Cosimo's agents could with huge credibility threaten to excommunicate you from the church if you didn't pay up. A serious threat for God-fearing people at the time. And their friend, the Pope, of course, opened a huge credit line with the Medici bank for the papacy. The Medici were God's bankers, and the Medici bank was now the most profitable business in Europe. But wealth had never been enough for Cosimo. He began to commission the finest craftsmen of his age. He sponsored people like Brunelleschi, who built the dome of the Florence Cathedral that had been standing there without a dome for over a hundred years because the original builders had not been able to build it. This had been a great shame for the city and Cosimo saw a chance to increase his influence and power. He hired the eccentric Brunelleschi to build the dome and let him be his eccentric self and with his money, Brunelleschi was able to finish the dome. This was a huge triumph for Cosimo and the Medici family. So much so, that on Cosimo's death in 1464, the city of Florence declared him, Pater Patri, father of the fatherland. Under their new leader, Lorenzo, the Medici family would patronize some of the greatest artists the world has ever seen. Artists like Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and many more. Two years after Cosimo's death in August 1466, the Medici were in danger once again. Rumors about a coup by rival families were swarming the city. The Medici needed new allies beyond the city of Florence. And for the first time the Medici family went outside the city for a wife, and Lorenzo married one of the most powerful families of the Roman aristocracy, the Orsini family. The marriage was very important because it established a link between the Medici family and Roman aristocracy. Clarice Rossini was the daughter of a Roman baron and the niece of a cardinal, she didn't only bring prestige, but also brought connections and military power to the Medici family. But even though Lorenzo now was the most powerful man in Florence, new threats to him and his family's future were emerging. The Pozzi family were a rival banking family and the second richest family in Florence, after the Medici. But they had an advantage over the Medici, of being of an older, grander and nobler lineage. The Pozzis had been marginalized by Lorenzo, and the Pozzis decided to take action. They wanted the total elimination of the Medici family, and set their eyes on Lorenzo and his brother. The Pozzis had very powerful friends and they knew the leaders of the Catholic Church were heavily in debt to the Medici Bank, and they were able to get the Church to collude with them, against the Medici. They laid a detailed plan, and knew they had to kill both brothers, if they were to be successful. But, rumors of a conspiracy started to spread and a new plan was needed, and the plan they chose, could not have been more sacrilegious. On Sunday, April 26, 1478, Easter Day, the Medici and all of Florence gathered to celebrate the holiest day of the year in the church. During Mass, a signal was given. Both Medici brothers were in the cathedral and the plotters sprang into action. Giuliano de' Medici was stabbed 19 times and died on the church floor. But in the commotion, Lorenzo had slipped away. From safety, Lorenzo shows himself to the crowd, as soon as that happens, the plotters realize that the game is up. The supporters of the Medici were furious over what had happened, and violence erupted in the streets of Florence, as supporters of the Medici took revenge. Lorenzo soon learned that the Pope himself had ordered the wipeout of the Medici family. 
He and his family were under threat again and in the winter of 1479, Lorenzo traveled to Naples to try to save his family's future. Lorenzo used all his skills and charm and gave gifts for all the courtiers. He managed to make a deal, and even though the Pope was very unhappy about this, his troops were called off. Lorenzo de' Medici had not only saved his own life, but had also saved Florence from destruction from the papal troops. After this, Florence hailed Lorenzo, giving him the nickname, Il Magnifico, or Lorenzo the Magnificent. But the experience had made Lorenzo realize that he needed to protect his family and to ensure there were heirs to follow him. He therefore, adopted the illegitimate son, of his murdered brother. Lorenzo now took full control over the city government, with Florence now under his personal control, he declared, that all legislation now required his approval. But even though, he now had complete political power, he didn't have spiritual power, and a powerful monk by the name of Savonarola, believed that Lorenzo was leading the city, on a decadent path to sin and destruction. Savonarola was against any kind of art that wasn't religious, making the patrons of the arts like the Medici, the target of his anger. If it had naked people in it, it would lead to sin. Savonarola's disgust became an obsession and he was sickened by what he saw around him, and turned towards Lorenzo as the leader of all that was sinful in Florence. Lorenzo was seriously shaken by this and had a huge religious crisis as a consequence. He turned to the church and put his faith in a new power base for his heirs. At just 16, he managed to get Giovanni de' Medici to become a cardinal in Rome. But this wasn't enough, because at his deathbed, still fearing eternal damnation, Lorenzo summoned Savonarola to seek absolution. But Savonarola was in no mood for forgiveness and his judgment was brutal. He damned Lorenzo, and Lorenzo died, fearing his eternal damnation. And with Lorenzo gone, Savonarola saw his chance and seized power in Florence and started a religious bonfire. Savonarola's fundamentalist regime was very brutal, and his commands were enforced by gangs of militant youths. Prostitutes were beaten and homosexuals burned, and they organized an enormous public burning. Lorenzo's renaissance was being burned at the pyre. After the coup by Savonarola, Giovanni and Giulio de' Medici, the new leaders of the family, was ousted from Florence. They were cousins, but were brought up as brothers. Giovanni de' Medici, Lorenzo's son, had been selected already as a child, to become a man of the church. Pope Alexander VI, one of the candidates to the title of most corrupt pope ever, summoned the new leader of Florence to Rome, when Florence refused to join the Pope's Holy League against the French. But Savonarola refused and continued to preach, even though he was under a ban. In 1497, he was excommunicated by the Pope, but Savonarola did not take this seriously, as he claimed that Alexander VI was not even a Christian and therefore not a legitimate Pope. But Savonarola's strict and brutal regime soon backfired and the people of Florence eventually had had enough. He was arrested, convicted of heresy, after confessing to these crimes under torture. On May 23, 1498, Savonarola was first hanged, and then, still alive, burned at the stake in the main square of Florence. But, even with Savonarola gone, the Medici brothers could not return, because the city of Florence had placed a price on both their heads. The Medici were now desperately seeking the support of friends, who could lead them on the path back to power. In 1501, Michelangelo started his work on a four-meter-tall marble block that had stood in use for many years, waiting for someone to dare to work on it. Michelangelo accepted the challenge and worked on the block for three years, creating one of the most iconic artworks in history. The Statue of David Michelangelo had been adopted by the Medici family at a young age when they discovered the young boy's remarkable talent. He had been raised by them, growing up with the now ousted Medici cousins. Growing up in the Medici house, he had seen, learned and got inspired by some of the greatest artists of the time, all working for the Medici. But, in David, Michelangelo also had created the ultimate symbol of opposition to the now ousted Medici, his former patrons, and family. David became a symbol of Florence resistance to the Medici, 
and Michelangelo now tried to distance himself as much as possible from the Medici while they were gone. After nine years in exile, Giovanni and Giulio de' Medici arrived in Rome and was granted a meeting with the new Pope, Julius II. He was also from a powerful family and he was sympathetic to the Medici and helped them raise an army. By 1512, thousands of soldiers were in Tuscany, closing in on the city of Florence, and the people of Florence prepared for the onslaught to come, knowing they were seriously outnumbered. The leaders of the city now called upon a political genius who had guided the Republic since the expulsion of the Medici and the burning of Savonarola, Niccolò Machiavelli. Machiavelli was able to mobilize thousands of men from all across Tuscany. But when the Medici army reached Prato, a fortified town just outside Florence, the Medici troops broke through the city wall and began a carnage of violence, blood, and murder. Machiavelli's soldiers didn't stand a chance. The sack of Prado was a bloodbath, and the Medici had won control of the city again, but not the loyalty of the people of Florence. Not long after that, Pope Julius II died, and the Medici had lost their papal protector. All the cardinals were now summoned to Rome to elect a new pope. This was the chance the Medici had been waiting for. They set their sights on the biggest price of them all, a Medici pope. The most senior cardinal in the Vatican at the time was none other than Giovanni de' Medici, and he would cast the last and deciding vote for the new pope. He cast his vote for himself, and Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici would be known to history as Pope Leo X. Giovanni's accession to the papacy changed everything for the Medici. For the first time in history, the leader of the Catholic Church had been born in Florence and the new pope soon capitalized on his new status and strengthened the position of the Medici family. With this new title, the city of Florence now welcomed back its former enemy with open arms. The pope's cousin, Giulio, was quickly made the Archbishop of Florence, and he also became a cardinal. This is called nepotism, something all the Renaissance popes practiced. Shortly after he was made pope, Leo wrote in a letter to one of his brothers, where he declared, and this is one of my favorite historical quotes of all time, saying, God has given us this papacy. Let's enjoy it. And enjoy it, he certainly did. As part of the celebrations of becoming the new pope, Leo had a young boy painted in gold from head to toe, symbolizing the return of a golden age under the Medici. But the painted boy died shortly afterwards, poisoned by the gold paint on his skin. Giovanni was a lover of fun and party and hosted elaborate dinners, night after night, in the Vatican. One ambassador sent a letter home saying, the meal was exquisite, there was an endless succession of dishes, for we had no less than 65 courses. The Medici family were now not only the rulers of Florence, they were now also the most important and powerful family in Europe. But, within a year of his reign, Leo's extravagant lifestyle would cast the papacy into huge debt and economic problems. Problems that Leo X thought he found a solution to, by the selling of indulgences, but it was a solution that would horrify a German priest named Martin Luther, causing him to post 95 theses on a church door, sparking the Reformation. The Reformation would throw Europe into wars of religion, wars that would last for centuries, all because of a Medici Pope's need to finance his extravagant lifestyle. Part 2 will be out soon, so if you liked this presentation, please like, subscribe and remember to push the notification button, so you don't miss when I upload Part 2. And please leave a comment below on what your thoughts are about the Medici family. And please check out my other videos on this channel to see if there are other topics you find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.